seated. If you take your Bible, this time we'll turn, it's page 909 in the Pew Bible. This is Acts chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 1 through 21 as you're turning. Uh, there's also a white sheet with an outline. The Holy Spirit revealed in power, Acts 2, 2 1 to 21. The Holy Spirit makes an entrance. Those who saw and heard, fulfilling the word of God, let all hear and call on the Lord. Again, as the church calendar would call this Pentecost to especially remind us of the gift of God, the promise from the Father of the Holy Spirit we have in our text the event of this promise given. Let's hear God's word, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. They divided tongues and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested each one of them, on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven, at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are these all not speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and the visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judah, Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days... It shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below and blood and fire and vapor and smoke and the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great, the day of the Lord comes, that great and magnificent day. And so it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. O oh Lord, open our hearts to know your word. Open our hearts to your spirit anew, that we would know, live, and praise our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Jesus told his followers to go back to Jerusalem and to wait there. And they did. They waited together. They waited in prayer. They waited focused on the word of God. They didn't know how long they would have to wait. Turns out it was 10 days. Now, if I say 10 days from now, something's going to happen, like 10 days from now, there's going to be a wedding. About 10 days, I'm going to officiate. Oh, the bride and groom, they're looking forward. Everybody's looking forward. 
because we know it's in 10 days. They didn't know it was how long it was going to be. When you don't know what's coming, it's a little different, isn't it? Is it today? Is it next? Who knows? Something's going to happen. We don't even know exactly what's going to happen. Sometimes God's voice is pretty calm, pretty still. You might be in a situation and you look back, and as you look back, you see God was at every point. Is that not encouraging? At the time, you didn't see it so much because it wasn't very loud. It wasn't very demonstrative. Sometimes God's hand is very soft. And in those times, we walk by faith and not by sight. We trust God is there, and later we may well see God's hand in all of it. As it turns out, the gift that God has given, this promise that is to come, is anything but subtle. The Holy Spirit makes an entrance. You know that expression, they made an entrance, that everyone's, well, he makes an entrance. There is sound, there is sight, there is a profusion of praising the Lord. We, we know these things, and it catches the attention of the city the way maybe the sound of a tornado might, or the sound of an earthquake, or how that would be. This is unlike anything that they'd seen. And of course, the thing that was really unique were all of these people praising God in all of these languages. What could this mean, they wonder. All right, the Holy Spirit makes an entrance. The Holy Spirit is, comes and it's seen in and around all of the followers of Jesus. Again, there's a sound, there's something to see, it's very unusual, but then they're praising God in all of these languages. It's a change in the people, and there's a boldness that happens as Peter stands to preach. This is the man who ran away a few weeks ago. This is a man who didn't have courage. Even one of those hymns that we sang, that we'd be able to do the things, that we'd be mighty to do the things, that unaided, we would fail at. Because unaided, Peter would fail. But he's not unaided anymore. The Holy Spirit is with him and in him. Oh, this is pretty exciting. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And I'll just underline that. They were together. Pentecost is 50 days. Penta, you get the 50 out of this. Uh, from the Passover. And this is also an Old Testament festival, the Feast of Weeks. And it's there specifically for several reasons. Uh, let it be sufficient to say that there's the crucifixion of Jesus that happens at the Passover. And that's not without significance because he is our real Passover lamb. And now this gift of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the scriptures, even on the Pentecost, the, the Feast of Weeks. Now there's three things that are noted about this coming of the Holy Spirit to the church. The first involved a sound, verse 2. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind that filled the entire house where they were sitting. It doesn't say it's a mighty wind, which could be terrifying. Mighty winds can be terrifying. It's the sound of the wind, though. Back in 2012, there was a tornado came through here. Uh, it went along the interstate. We heard it. Glad for a basement. It got off at exit 29 and did all that there, the damage there. You remember this if you were here. Uh, is that a freight train? What is that going by? The sound will grab you. Well, this is something that they heard, and it didn't have a wind. This is something that the Lord was showing. The wind, the whole business of wind. Uh, we think of wind and breath and they're kind of the same word. In fact, you have the word spirit. You've got that breeze coming out of you. It, in Hebrew, it's ruach, uh, pneuma, which is the word they have in Greek. 
ghost, geist, that's the German spirit. Spirit and breath is the same sort of thing. Uh, in fact, what did Jesus say in John chapter 3? He said, everyone who is born of the spirit is like the wind. You see where it comes. You, you, you don't really see where it comes or where it goes, but you hear it. You know it's there. So is everyone who is born of the spirit, born again of the spirit. Here we have these believers who become different because of the Holy Spirit. Second thing is a visible thing. Verse 3, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Fire is purifying. We're looking in Amos and all of these judgments. It says fire is going to come down. Fire is going to burn your place. That's pretty terrifying. And our God is a consuming fire because he is holy. But this is not the fire of judgment coming upon them. This is the fire showing the presence of God. You remember when Moses was out in the desert and he saw a bush that looked like it was burning but it wasn't consumed. He said, kind of like they say, what's going on here? He turned aside to see. The voice of God came and told him, take your sandals off. This is holy ground. The fire, not consuming, but that which is seen, was to show the presence of God. Now, when I was little, I thought about this expression, tongues of fire. Huh? But I've watched fires. and You watch the little tongues that lap up. I can now visualize that. Now, the presence of the Holy Spirit is shown visibly by these tongues of fire. And, of course, the tongues and the, now these new languages and the praise of God that all is unlocked. Uh, we see that as, as well with the word tongue. But it's visible that God's presence is there. There's going to be life in their words. People are going to be converted as the gospel comes from their mouths because the Holy Spirit will use that as well. The power to convict comes from the Holy Spirit and the heart's new and changed. All this is happening. Well, the first two things hails the descent of the Spirit, sight and sound. But the third is the one I think is most effective. First two really do grab your attention in no uncertain terms. But it's very effective in the way it changes people because it talks about the change in the believers themselves and communicates to others. Verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This was the fulfillment of the promise. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to go away. They were very sad. He says, if I don't go away, the comforter won't come. There's going to be another one like me to come, to be with you. It'll be better. It can't be better. It'll be better. The Spirit will be with you. This is what Jesus was talking about. The Holy Spirit in them and with them. Unlike the human Jesus who will only be one place, one time at one place. Although the resurrected Jesus got around pretty quickly. The Holy Spirit is with his people all over the world. Wherever we are. The 12 apostles would take the lead, this is adding Matthias to the crew, in preaching the word and witnessing, but the Spirit comes to all of these who are gathered. There's 120 about. There's men and women with the Holy Spirit on them, speaking in these tongues, speaking in these languages, praising God. And that's the main thing I want to notice, praising God. There's more, though. Why is this? It takes a while for the, the apostles to even understand this. But what this is saying at the very beginning is that this gospel is not just for these people in Jerusalem. It's not even just for the Jews. It's for everybody everywhere. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You heard that twice already from Joel and also the quoting from Joel that Peter does. This is the gospel that will go to the ends of the earth. Second point, those who saw and heard. 
Well, this is pretty amazing to the, to the followers of Jesus. Here's the, the promise, and here it is, and whoo boy, this is a lot. But as amazing as that was, the way it's seen by others is also transformative for them. This begins the process of what Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. It all starts right here, even with the, the uttermost parts of the earth, because they begin to come there to see it. That begins as well. Verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. These were Jews of what we call the diaspora. They are all out there. They are Hellenistic Jews. There were some Greeks who came to see Jesus. You know, we would see, they came to the disciples, we would see Jesus. These are Jewish people, and they also talk about those who've converted to Judaism, maybe out in the diaspora, but they're all Jewish people from all over the places, all over the, that's mentioned here. Uh, they've come, many of them, because this was one of the major festivals. You gather for the major festivals if you can. Some of them may have been there at Pentecost, and they knew, I'm sorry, at Passover, and they knew all about Jesus. Some may have even stayed, because it'd be a long way home, we'll just stay for the next one. Some may have heard about all this happen, and they wonder, you know, we should show up at the next festival because after what happened at the last one, maybe we should be part of this. All of these things, they would know these things. Would something happen at Pentecost like it happened at Passover? Yeah. The visitors were there. Those who lived in Jerusalem were there. What did they do? Maybe they heard the wind. It was filled the house. But if it was allowed, who knows? That may have been. And then they saw the tongues of fire, perhaps, as they, but they also heard all this commotion of these people praising God in the morning, at 9 o'clock in the morning. Verse 6, at the sound, they came together and were bewildered, because each one was hearing them, these are the followers of Jesus, speak in his own language. The foreign-born Jews come, and they hear the praise of God in their own mother tongue. Now they come to Jerusalem and they're expecting to hear things maybe in Aramaic, the trade languages perhaps, certainly in Hebrew, it's the celebrations, that's what they come, but they weren't expecting to hear their own languages. Now I've traveled some countries, I didn't know the language, I tried to berlitz my way through, the, the berlitz was an old guidebook that would say, use these phrases, they'll help you, right? Uh, and, and, but I speak English, English is a major trade language. All over the world, there are people that speak English. Not everybody, but all over. It's pretty common. When I hear someone speak English, I'm not surprised. You know, this is Italy, after all, or this is France, or wherever. Well, Paris, give it your best shot at French. But they do know your, they know their English. But imagine somebody from uh, Eritrea is, is hearing Tigrinian. You're thinking, where is Eritrea and what is Tigrinian? It's exactly, right? These are languages that you're not expecting to hear at all. And here's a bunch of people praising God in this language. That's unusual. Where did they come from? Wait a minute. They're not even from my place. They're from, they're from the hills. Remember the Galileans? They were the bumpkins, right? How did this happen? Verse 7, they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Uh, you wouldn't expect them. You would expect them to know Greek, maybe. Maybe some Latin. It depends on where they were. You need a trade language. But these other languages, where would they even learn them? They're flabbergasted. And there's 15 that are mentioned here. These are languages represented all from all over the Mediterranean, way off to the east in Mesopotamia, uh, over to the west, uh, toward Libya, uh, Italy, Rome, all these, they're there. They were Jewish people who heard. They were proselytes, people who became Jews from these places they heard. 
different dialects. Could you imagine hearing it in your own dialect? Could you imagine hearing it in your own accent? The way you speak? Oh, all over this country, we've got different accents. Imagine that. This is what they heard. I'm going to read these. You may not know where they all are, but you can get a map and look them up. They're all over the place. Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, okay, well, that's where we were, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, we're up in Turkey and around through there, uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, that's the Isle of Crete, Arabians, we hear them telling in our own languages the mighty works of God. God is being praised, and it says they're all amazed, and they're perplexed. How could this possibly be? What does this mean? That's the right response, by the way. You see this, and you think, what is going on here? Moses sees the burning bush and says, it's not consumed. What is going on here? He turns aside. But there are others who are quick to make fun of things they don't understand. Do you know people that sometimes make fun of things they don't understand? Let's not be one of those. What do they say? They're filled with new wine. Yeah, these bumpkins, they're probably just drunk babbling. Because if you're a local person, you're not hearing your language because these are the languages of the people who came in. All you hear sounds like babble, right? They just must be drunk. Who knows what's going on? Foreigners hear their own language, though, and they're amazed. Interesting, the local people are probably the ones mocking more. Third point, fulfilling the word of God. You know, you need sometimes God to explain what's going on. And Peter is given the gift to do this. He rises. He addresses the mockers first. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Now that's men of Judea, the people who are the locals. But all who dwell, these are the visitors too. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, and the way they, that'd be like nine in the morning. Instead, this is fulfillment of the word of God. Again, notice the attention to the word of God. Peter, who looked at the word of God and said, let's fill out the office that was lost when Judas Iscariot killed himself and abandoned it and, and forsook it. Here, it's the word of God that's brought to his mind, and he begins to open this up. This is what Jesus had promised, and this is what had been promised in the word of God. Verse 16. This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and in the last days shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Not just this prophet or that per prophet or this important person or this son of this house, but all kinds of people. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Young and old, men and women, important people, unimportant people, Educated people, uneducated people, powerful people, helpless people. The Lord is not a respecter of persons. The Spirit comes, the hearts are changed. It resides, the Spirit, he resides in his people. Now the passage in Joel continues with what's called apocalyptic language. It speaks about the day of the Lord coming. An outpouring of the Spirit, we're talking about and even seeing here. You are now witnesses of this event, Peter is saying. And it continues with the apocalyptic language. I will show you the wonders in heaven, the signs above, signs on earth below, fire, blood, vapor, smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, that great and magnificent day. There's a lot here as well. And I'm not going to spend too much time with it. But God's unexpected plan is in motion. And we're here in the last days where the presence of God has come. 
This is not what the people expected. Reading Joel, they might not have expected this either. But reading a lot of the prophets, they didn't expect what happened with Jesus. And yet Jesus said, it's all right here. As they went along to, to, to Emmaus, these two men going, oh, it's terrible that this happened. We thought he was the Christ. And Jesus, they didn't know as Jesus walked along and said, really? It's exactly what the scripture said is going to happen. How about here? How about here? How about here? How about there? That would have been fun to be along, huh? And then they realized, oh, it is Jesus who's done this. Fourth point, let all hear and call on the name of the Lord. This is the new thing that's come. It's come to the Jews, but it's not just for the Jews. Not just for the Jews in Judea. It does include those further out in the diaspora. But it's not just for the Jews themselves. Not just those in Galilee. Not just those who've converted, become proselytes. It's bigger than this. And they're not going to fully understand it, but it's shown right here in the very languages that are given. Verse 21. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now it's amazing that everybody, like young and old and men and women and powerful and not powerful and all these, all these nobodies even, it's open to them. But bigger than that, it's not just for the Jews. It's not just for these people here. It's going to be for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Why do you think the first thing that the Holy Spirit does is to have these believers speak in all of these languages and have them recognize us? Languages they didn't learn is to show that the gospel is not limited to one language, one place, one people. We read in Revelation around the throne of God that there are those from every tongue and every tribe. The mission of the the Bible translators is to go out and to get the language in the heart, get the Bible in the heart language of the people that they could hear and know for themselves. We go, we take the word to the ends of the world. Ben Skaggs talks about this. You know, we're getting, we're getting the, the chronological gospel, the program he has for, for the Bible teaching into this language. Can you give it and translate it into this language? And it's there. And he takes them out into places. Some places they've never heard the gospel at all. Some places they haven't seen anybody looked as light as he is. The Browns who've been down on the Amazon River for more than 25 years to working with the Yanomami and their language to bring the word of God to them. And they translate the Bible into their language so the people can have it and read it and know it and learn. You don't need to go far to find those, though, who need to hear the gospel and to put their trust in Christ. I begin by asking the people to whom I preach, to those who hear, are you trusting in Christ? Do you see that this is for you? I mean, what comes out of this next is a sermon that lays out what has happened challenges the people who are cut quick, uh, they are cut to the heart, convicted of sin, and they say, brothers, men, what can we do? And the answer is, you can believe, you can receive. This is for you too. He reminds them of Jesus' death and their part that they played in it. What do we do? You can have peace with God. You can have new life. You can have joy. Your life can be changed. Say, well, I've got this all figured out in my head. Guess what? Your head's not big enough, I'm thinking. Neither is your heart. Open your heart to Jesus. You can have a purpose in your life that's eternal. It doesn't stop. It doesn't even stop at death. It continues. And you face death not with uncertainty, but with, with confidence and hope. You'll see Jesus the lover of your soul. Do you think about that? You can. It also reminds us that we are to be witnesses of the gospel, to be sharing the good news of God. What did they hear? They heard the praises of God in their own language. There are ways we can speak for God, praise God, thank God. It should be in our hearts and coming out of our mouths. Someone may come up to you and say, 
could you tell me how to become a Christian? That happened to me once. Has that ever happened to you? Teach me to be a Christian. Well, okay then. Let's start here. But most of the time, the questions they ask don't come like that. They're asking because they want to know about you and what they've seen in you. They want to hear and to know that this is true. So you share the gospel and you pray because the Holy Spirit who works in your heart to assure you of God's presence convicts you of sin and fills you with his grace will also work with them and you pray for that. You can speak in your own language the mighty works of God because if that's their language that's the one they need to hear it in. And the Lord is with you. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, dwell in me. I myself would holy be. O Lord, show us day by day that we would forsake that which is wrong and choose that which is good. That we would be truthful, that we would be full of your praise and your word. And we'd be able to communicate your love to others. Lord, again, I pray for your church. I pray that our hearts would be focused and fixed on our Lord Jesus, indeed, our bridegroom, our love, that our lives would be measured and motivated by that love. And we pray for your church to grow in confidence in you. Lord, teach us to be sensitive to your presence, to not grieve your spirit, but to embrace your ways. Oh, by your word, in through our hearts, make us more like Jesus. And Lord, I do pray for those who look and wonder, what can all this mean? This means the gift of God is there before them. Holy Spirit, give them understanding to receive it with joy. We pray this through Jesus, our King. Amen.